Board Welcome the to the Donahue Group. Glad you could join <laughs> us. We're talking about state issues. Before we get going, I'd like to introduce our group to my close right, Ken Risto. <laughs> just sort of in, in charge of social <laughs> studies. In Closer, charge of, right. There you go, in charge of social studies, sort of, for the Sheboygan Area School District. It's a t yeah, it's a title. Tom Paneski, sort of in charge of mathematics yeah, for the uh, UW uh, centers, or UW Sheboygan. Cal Potter, in charge of retirement. <laughs> Me, I'm in charge of nothing, but I'm here with a game face on, and it's a special day because we are, now, we are now, we are now, we are now celebrating our Cable Award of Merit. Um, now, we celebrated this on the local show, but this is worth repeating. Along with eight, with seven other programs <coughs> on Channel uh, 8, we have been awarded the um, um, Awards of Merit. And it is a great honor. We're pretty thrilled. Unfortunately, unlike the Emmys or the Oscars or whatever, we have to buy our <laughs> awards. <laughs> and we're cheap. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not the award, but the symbol of winning. Yeah. I think even the certificate might cost money. I'm not sure. Carrie is, is, is checking on that for us. But our little tasteful statuette or whatever, it, it, it is going to cost money. So if you want to send in money <laughs> to, in care of the Donahue Group so that we can purchase this and have it on the table for every... Um, Every program, uh, actually, you don't have to do that. Among the four of us, we're we going to take up a collection, out, yeah. we are? and it's going to it's going to go from house to house on a monthly huh. basis. Find your wallets, <laughs> <laughs> and whoever has it will be responsible for bringing it in. And in any event, pretty cool. We're we're happy, and of course, we richly deserve this award. But we <laughs> we <laughs> we'd like to thank for our producers. Good humility, <laughs> <laughs> saying that. Yeah. Our camera folks and our own witty intelligence and. I said it on the first program, I'd like to say again, I thank my mom and my husband and my children who've been so supportive of my career through the years. <laughs> <laughs> and in the immortal words... Is there words, some music we can cue up to get her off the In the immortal stage. words of Sally Field, you really do like us. <laughs> so, I thought that was pretty cute. All right, we're going to move on to actual serious business. Sally Field or you? Who's Sally Field. Oh, okay. All right. Whatever. <laughs> in any event, lots to talk about at the state uh, level. Um, our legislators and governor, thankfully, are still trying at least to deal with our projected $527 million budget shortfall this year. Um, the hospital tax is done. I'm convinced, Tom, dear Republican friend of mine, that if we tax the hospital under this particular proposal, the federal government reimburses the hospitals for said tax. Now, the only problem is, is you're going to have an attack ad that's going to say Republicans t voted to increase taxes on hospitals. You guys wouldn't do that, would wouldn't you? Because <laughs> the hospitals are for this tax. The hospitals yeah. are for this tax. Because it's not costing them anything. Yeah. So can't the Republicans figure out a way to just pander proof this and, you know, that we could just move ahead with, with getting some money on... But Wisconsin is about 47th I mean, in the number of the states in terms of the, what we get from the federal two government. Two things. The government money still is tax money. Uh, and the second thing is the hospitals now will have uh, services that they'll provide with this money. And then when that money goes away the next year and the next year and the next year, uh, they're gonna, they won't get rid of the service. So they're going to have to raise the cost on the health care providers and everything else. And so it's going to this is just a, spin around and keep going up. But this is just <laughs> a state-federal shell game. Is, you know, the hospital pays the money to the state as a tax, and then the hospital gets said money from the feds as a reimbursement. I mean, there aren't any additional services. It's a shell game. I mean, it's... It, it, and Wisconsin... We're not very good at, at sucking at the federal trough, not as good as Mississippi and West Virginia Louise and West Virginia and so forth. I need a Bob Caston in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. You said it. I not, said it. Not not we. <laughs> so um, they're going to, there's a proposal to refinance the tobacco settlement, which was sold for pennies on the dollar in the McCallum administration to balance the budget. Uh, the state was due to get $1.2 billion of my recollection from the mm -hmm. tobacco settlement, and they discounted it to a value of, I don't know, 
how many millions uh, in order to, uh, to get a present value out of it. There's some pluses and minuses to that. Um, should we just wait for the recession, first of all, to be declared and then to be over? Well, one of the, you hear some people say, well, why is the state uh, so deeply in debt? Well, that this is also a projected deficit. We're in a two-year budget, and there's still time to go on this budget. And so when we're talking about what will the deficit or the books look like a year from now, that's where the projected deficit is. And so uh, some of the things we're talking about here are not trying to alleviate a debt that's been incurred. Mm -hmm. It's what will occur were we not to do anything, and the fiscal bureau and other financial gurus have said with a downturn in the economy, this is what the books will look like at the end of the two-year biennial budget. So when we look at these different creative mechanisms, there's time to implement them and time to, to uh, make adjustments in the budget bill to, to balance the books. Mm -hmm. It's a lot better than it was a while back, if you remember. We had mm -hmm. a very substantial deficit in the state. So. Um, Let's hope the economy doesn't turn down uh, too much more. And I think this is a, a very doable situation. The problem, I guess, is uh, you've got conservatives who don't want any type of revenue enhancements um, to be enacted. And so that's why this negotiations between the governor and particularly the legislature and, and the assembly particularly is taking so long. And it's my sense, and I'm just interested in your viewpoint, you can certainly point to extraordinary pork and waste in the federal budget but it's my sense that, I mean, other than the huge amount that we pay for prisons, our state tax dollars are pretty well used. Sure. I, uh, you know, um, education, highways, um, it, it just seems to me that, number one, there aren't a lot of places to cut unless you really, you know, are going to take developmentally disabled people and throw them back in institutions sure. or out on the street or, or whatever. I don't know. True, false? No, I think they're well used. Uh, Especially in the university. Well, the university... <laughs> Green uh, Bay could stop sending me pencils every <laughs> semester. But. Yeah, the university gets pinched every once in a while. Uh, and students are having to finance more and more of their education. But uh, I used to have a book salesman that would come up from Kentucky. He said he, he actually eventually moved to Wisconsin from Kentucky. He says, I don't mind paying the extra taxes. They've got good school systems. They've got good parks. They've got good libraries. They've got a lot of nice amenities, and uh, I know it costs money. So, you know, I remember that. So uh, I think so it is well used. Our tax dollars are, are well used. I, I think Wisconsin it has a system of sharing with the wealth of the state with units of government that a lot of people don't realize. Um, about 75% of the state budget is formula driven, mm -hmm. meaning it's Medicare or Medicaid, excuse me, Medicaid, <coughs> or shared revenue, or school aids, or yeah. or highway aids, or whatever, and so when people start saying, well, why doesn't the governor just take a meat axe to this budget? Um, well, somebody's going to be left holding, and it's going to be people who are in nursing homes. It's going to be people who are um, on the city council or on the school board who are going to be have to make up the difference. And you know, how do you want your poison? Do you want it on the property tax, or do you want it? Uh, shared from income tax and sales tax, which has a broader constituency that pays into it. I, I know there, I always run, I used to run into people who would say, oh, the best taxes are always local. I says, well, well, look at the fact that today we're a global economy. Maybe it's better to tax uh, companies that do business all over the world. Uh, they share the cost of paying their Wisconsin tax with people in France and China and everywhere else, uh, the economy of scale for them is such that they're, it's better for them to be able to uh, spread the pain around. And so why should you put all the onus on the little old lady who owns a, a home and put it on the property tax if you can in a way capture sales tax revenue from tourists and uh, you know, others who, who come to this state? As an aside, do you think whatever Ever consider a toll road in, in uh, <laughs> Wisconsin? Has, I'm sure that's been raised many times, and I don't know what the discussion has been on it. Well, the, the, the discussion that has been in, uh, in the past has been uh, the federal government precluded the establishment of toll roads <coughs> on roads that were built with federal monies. 
In other words, when I-43 is built or whatever, I-94, I-90, oh, okay. okay. and you want to <laughs> retrofit them and now collect the toll, the Fed said, hey, wait a minute, we paid 75% to okay. build this or okay. whatever, um, therefore you cannot charge a toll. Um, if you look at you know, the Pennsylvania Turnpike and the Illinois Turnpikes and so on, uh, those are all built um, solely by the state. Gosh, and really? I did not know that. I did not know and, that. and the monies that, that. Were, were garnered to pay the, the cost of the maintenance and construction. Oh, interesting. Now, if federal policy has changed, I don't know, but okay. that was the argument in the past. And, and the state generally, when we had the argument in the past, and, and people would suggest that, uh, it was that if we were to embark upon this, it would be more expensive uh, and more of an inconvenience and a pain because you have to have limited access and those type of things. It's better to take the 75% federal dollars, build the road and have as many accesses and entrances as you can yeah. for businesses and communities. Then it was just better public policy to go that route. Okay. But now you're seeing uh, with obviously so many of these roads getting to the end of their life expectancy, there is more and more talk about even privatizing roads. I think Illinois has privatized part of the tollway and there are a number of states that are doing this. Mm. Uh, it remains to be seen what the long haul will be on this because okay. obviously the, these companies aren't there to be benevolent, they're there to make a profit, profit sure. and how long they can sustain tolls that are regional, uh, reasonable. Uh, I don't know, I haven't been to Illinois for a while, but for years it was only 40 cents when the state ran the toll roads. I guess it's... It's a whole lot more it's now. It's a whole lot more, I know <laughs> it is, uh, but that's because there's a whole, a whole new player in there who doesn't subsidize this in some way. Oh, interesting. Well, one of the other things that's happening in the budget negotiations <clears throat> that I think has a number of people pretty steamed up, and I think with some cause, is to fold the uh, uh, verification uh, of the Great Lakes Compact into the budget process, which seems to me to be terrible public policy. I mean, I can be as upset as I want to be that the Assembly is not allowing the, the Great Lakes Compact to move forward, but fold that into the budget bill? <laughs> well, the budget bill... Get it passed. That's the goal, right? <laughs> in the state of Wisconsin, you have one of the most uh, restrictive um, relating clauses in bills that you'll find anywhere. In Congress, you can put a battleship on an education bill. Wisconsin, you cannot. Sure. What the relating clause in the start of a bill, uh, proposed laws, that's what is very, very strict and there are people there are amendments that do come in and people will in the assembly get up and say mr speaker i raised the germaneness issue and the speaker rules on reads the the relating clause in the first paragraph and says yeah your your carpooling amendment or whatever it is 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 uh, non-germane yeah, ruled not appropriate the budget bill however uh if you read the relating first paragraph of the budget bill is this is state government and we finance everything and <laughs> everything is germane. So you can put anything because everything costs money, whether it's printing paper or hiring staff or whatever mm -hmm. it would happen mm -hmm. to be. It is the only bill that is germane to put anything that you want to get done quickly into. And so that's why sometimes at 3 o'clock in the morning on the last day of the budget, you have all these legislators throwing these things in uh, because they know that this is this train is leaving the station <coughs> and you want to put your bags on it because no other no other train is coming along <laughs> because you've got the germaneness issue so well, I didn't know that specific fact either so it, it, this it, has been a worthwhile show you know, it stinks as far as <laughs> watching lawmaking it's like watching sausage you shouldn't do it but it is a bill that creates an opportunity for the governor and others to put things and get things done the governor really wants this Great Lakes Compact, and the legislature is out of regular session. The only thing that's left is a special session with three bills. You can't put the compact on the campaign refinance bill, so what do you do? The only other bill that you can tie it with in some way is the budget bill. Mm -hmm. So that's what he's doing. And that happened fairly often in your tenure? Sure. It's just this seems to be a fairly important public policy issue yes. that you'd like to hold up, yeah. but of course it's not going to get passed then. <clears throat> unless there seems to be some movement forward, which there unfortunately does not yeah. seem to be, so, but uh, interesting. Well, <clears throat> the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, came down with an interesting case, an interesting decision um, uh, 
uh, right at the end of April uh, relating to the Indiana voter ID case, a 6-3 vote, um, and um, uh, a win for uh, Indiana, which has one of the most restrictive uh, uh, policies in the U.S. in terms of requiring a picture ID, a state-issued picture ID in order to vote. So you come to the voting poll with your picture ID. My understanding from the articles that I've read, there are only two states that are Correct. that restrictive, Indiana and... I don't, I'd I be don't guessing. Know. Right. There's 25 of the 50 states that have some sort of state-issued document that you need to vote. Mm -hmm. and, but Indiana and two other states actually have a photo ID. So really, I mean, as far as I can tell, any state can do anything at this point. And I mean, I don't think we're quite back to the poll tax yet for two literacy exams, but uh, you can really require a pretty picture. And It was an odd decision. I mean, the media is talking 6-3, but in reality it was, and it was 6-3, but it was 3-3-3. Three, three, three. Uh, the court, there were three, there were six justices that, that got to the same conclusion. Three used one type of logic, and uh, that was Justice Scalia and Alioto and Justice, Tom, well, Justice Thomas, of course, as goes Scalia, as goes, so goes Thomas. Um, and those three pretty much said the states can pass almost any law they want as long as it applies to all of its citizens equally, and if it works out that it disadvantages some, teach, uh, some, some citizens, well, it's life's, life's tough in the aluminum siding business. Um, the other three, uh, led by Justice Stevens, they were the ones who wrote, well, Stevens wrote the opinion. And, and uh, it really, it, it doesn't solve the situation for much longer because it was a very curious, that opinion was very curiously written. It said that, well, first of all, you didn't really show the court that there was a problem. You know, so, you know, <laughs> we're, we're, you're giving the state of Indiana permission to address a, a problem that really isn't a problem yet. And that's going to open the door because in that opinion, Stevens at least laid up the possibility that later on, if a state, or a group more accurately, can show that uh, they have in fact been burdened uh, unfairly because of the parts of the statute that are put into place, those three justices, as long as the three in dissent, would probably form a different majority and go the other way. So they're basically telling the states, do pretty much what you want, but we will pretty much expect to see citizens coming back and saying, uh, because of these burdens uh, that are, were required, uh, you have to go get a birth certificate, you gotta go find time off, you gotta go to your county seat, you gotta pay for that birth certificate, um, those kinds of things. When they can show that that's led to a disproportionate number of elderly, African American, Hispanics, young people are not being able to vote, they're, the court may just change its mind on it. You know, what is interesting, Justice Breyer in dissent pointed out that the cost of getting a birth certificate is actually more expensive than the poll tax that the court struck down 40 years ago, even adjusting for inflation. Yes. And uh, I think what you're going to see end up happening is uh, it'll be back in court fairly soon, certainly after this next presidential election. It is true, and typically in a court case, judges are much happier if they have people who have standing and and standing means yeah. that you're affected by the problem and to deal with lofty issues that don't have concrete people with concrete situations attached to them is usually something that a court won't do and so the fact that they even accepted accepted the case the US Supreme Court only has doesn't have to accept any cases really and it certainly is very picky about the cases it does choose um, it could have just said this is not not ripe for adjudication because no one's I mean, we've assumed that there are going to be problems. I certainly assume there will be problems, but you're right. The decision said you really haven't laid that out for us strongly enough. And those are the kinds of decisions lawyers like because they're less global, they're less universal than yep. Scalia <clears throat> at all. And, uh, and it does leave the, the door open. And you can get a U.S. Supreme or even a Wisconsin Supreme Court decision where you do craft together a majority, but there are six different opinions. And... So you read through all six and you say, well, what is the state of the law? What is going on here? And, and, and it can sometimes be very difficult. Lawyers like that because it leaves that little tiny little crack that you can kind of try to drive your truck through at some point in the future. Yeah. Essentially, the decision said is the state has a, an interest in maintaining the integrity of elections. Mm -hmm. 
as long, uh, until we see some evidence that particular groups of citizens have been unfairly uh, burdened by such regulations as the state may make. That's where we are, and mm -hmm. so it'll be, yeah, they'll be back. And it'll be back after the presidential election because there you're going to get a chance to look at a lot of you know, high voter yeah. turnout and you'll get a chance to look at the demographics and, and then the six, you know, uh, absent the, the three, uh, will probably be more amenable to, to taking a look at it then. You'll see it again. Yeah. I think it's a way to organize disenfranchised groups. I mean, you can say, let's go get our picture IDs, you know, and then you can vote. I mean, it's an well, yeah, organizing I thought that's tool. A, it's organized, that's, mm -hmm. that's a great organizing tool. I think it's a plus. You yeah. Know? So I you always say... Of course, say, when that happens, always then say the Republicans the, will... <laughs> always say to, you know, be careful what you wish for, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so you got the, the, the Republican legislature passed the ID law, and it, a lot of partisan bickering, but no evidence, and that's basically what... The, yeah. So they got And there's their no wish. evidence on either side. No, on either side. So the state... Can legislate. Yeah. As well, it sees fit. It's a classic. And be careful what you wish for because it may be very well a campaign mm -hmm. or an organizing kind of tool mm -hmm. and uh, come back to bite them. And it's just one of those classic solutions in search of a problem. Yes. And you just see that so often. I mean, the school district, uh, the school board was one of my complaints. So we say this is a great solution, but no one has yet to be able to articulate for me what the problem is that we're trying to solve here. And when people really get down to it, there is no problem or it, it, hasn't, it hasn't ripened into a problem. Well, there's, there's a problem in the sense that it's with conservatives who don't like uh, at the poll registration. They want to make it so that you can't go down the, the black neighborhood with a bullhorn and say, all right, today we want you all to get down there and vote and all you have to do is bring your utility bill or whatever and you'll get all these people who go around the block lined up to vote. One way to <coughs> eliminate that completely, the on-site voter registration is by putting in these laws that say you've got to have a certain ID with your picture on it and you've got to go through certain uh, machinations in order to comply with this law. It's going to preclude uh, on-site registration is going to preclude uh, whipping up people to, to vote, uh, people who normally don't vote. Um, so you're really disenfranchising a group and you're cutting out a campaign technique or an election day technique that is used in some states. And interestingly enough, absentee voters, at least in Wisconsin sure. under the proposed law, don't have to go down to the courthouse or to the, I'm sorry, to the clerk's office to pick up their absentee ballot and show a picture ID. Well, they wouldn't have to do that, so the folks who are going to Florida and so forth. But in any event, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. I think it'd be fair to say, though, in the state of Wisconsin with a Democratic Senate and a Democratic governor, there's no real chance of a voter ID, no. unless it's attached to a budget bill of some sort or another. <laughs> oh, no. Well, you've, uh, the senator from this district has been a perennial mm -hmm. introducer of the yeah. photo ID. And if you remember the news conference that he had, uh, the yeah. uh, chairman mm -hmm. of the committee to which that bill was referred had been walking, was walking by the news conference and started making some comments and saying this bill is dead, it's not going to, and I, th I think the senator said something to why don't you have a hearing on my bill and let it out, and, and he basically said, because I don't agree with it. <laughs> and, and so well, I'm in power. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Were, yeah. When you're that's in power, we you all, we'll That's have right. No, that, yeah. that's that's why those majorities are nice. Yeah. Um, Being in power means everybody sits down for four hour, four years and or two years and be and is quiet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. pretty much. Um, just a couple of other issues that have come up. Um, Steve Kagan, of course, is the new um, uh, congressman from which district? Green Bay. Green well, Bay. it's just Green Bay. Uh, um, yeah, whatever uh, district. Eighth, 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 eighth district. Eight, yeah, Thank you. Eight. Toby Ross. I'm still used the, to nine districts. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and John Gard has indicated he's going to get back in the race. I think, <coughs> I beg your pardon, um, I'll be healthy next, uh, next taping. Um, your best shot at getting an incumbent, I think, is in that very first election mm -hmm. cycle after. That's right. And That's what correct. Gard has said is, I now have a record that I can hold up and run against, which, of course, mm -hmm. when, with the two of them together, um, that, that really didn't happen. 
Kay, or, uh, Kagan, on the other hand, is not going to have to spend probably quite so much of his own money this time. Um, think he'll stay in? I don't think he's done anything particularly controversial. Well, it depends on whether it coattails. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think this is a presidential year. It's going to be a big turnout. Um, so it remains to be seen, but you, you're right. I mean, the 8th District is traditionally pretty Republican, isn't it? Yep. Father Cornell was the last uh, Democrat, and that goes way back, <laughs> 60s, probably. Mm -hmm. So... Well, what does that say about, the, I mean, obviously Kagan was a physician, he didn't have a voting record, and he's, you know, guards right, you've got now something to hold up and say he's voted for this, 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 and this, and this is not what I don't think our, our district is all about. But if guard really lost in an open election, there was a lot of money on both sides thrown around mm -hmm. in, that, in that race, and he lost the first time, I mean, I'm surprised that the, Repu I'm surprised the Republicans haven't found someone else to run against him. I mean, I know it was a very, very close election. Mm -hmm. Well, and Guard's pretty well known. Yeah, yeah and he had sort of yeah, a record right. that they went after on the state level because he was yeah. in the state legislature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's not well, or he was not particularly, Guard was not particularly well liked, it's my understanding. Um, but he was in the legislature a good long time, and, <clears throat> and he was the speaker. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's, you know, a fair position of power there. And um, so it'll be interesting to see how that all plays well, out. Well, and, and you know, the, the Republicans now who would like to get back into control because they lost the majority in 06 yeah. are saying, now, what are the 20 seats that we really have to pour all our money into? Mm -hmm. right. And if you look at the margin of victory by Kagan and you look at the historical voting pattern, um, first Democrats since mm -hmm. Cornell in the 60s, um, you come to the conclusion that's where you put your money. You bet. And so there's going to be a lot of bucks spent. Mm -hmm by both sides, mm -hmm. and I hate to be anybody who watches Green Bay television because you're going to speak, you'll be nauseated by the number of ads and, mm -hmm. the, and probably the meanness of those ads. Yeah. Just a minute left. Um, I noted on um, uh, WISP politics that uh, Obama's fundraising in uh, the state of Wisconsin far exceeds Clinton's. Either of them, however, far exceed John McCain's. I was interested that Obama spent three times what Clinton spent in Pennsylvania. It didn't narrow her lead, but it, it would seem that no matter how much money you throw at something, at a certain point, there's the tipping Love point doesn't happen. Love diminishing returns is yeah. the same yeah. economics. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, so I think that I think that's all pretty interesting. And uh, Weineke says the Democrats are still working hard. They don't need a candidate right now. Who knows? You need our TV show. We hope that you'll come back and join us next time.